My name is Mike Rodriguez, and for the last 14 years, I've been hosting a pro audio podcast called The Audio Nowcast with a bunch of my industry friends. After spending 20 years working in windowless studios like this one, they sent me free. Goodbye, little room. So I decided to go out and travel the world, meeting new people, having some amazing adventures, and film the spaces where audio is made, played, or listened to. This is Audio Nowcast Spaces. Welcome to Striper Tour 1990. Here we are in lovely Toronto. Here is our room, French on our room. We just got up. Just got up. This is the start of our videotape. My name is Brent Jeffers. I'm a keyboard tech piano tuner, and I reside here in the music city of Nashville. So we're off to the Waffle House. <laughs> I'm so glad I set up this camera. It's our favorite little <laughs> greasy spoon here in Nashville. <laughs> All right, man, Waffle House. We're at the Waffle House. I haven't house. been to Waffle House like since I was basically on tour. Yeah. Or if I really want to tell the truth, since like Thursday. All right, let's roll. Waffle House. I'm so full. Waffle House. You know what? That was really delicious. It was good. That was really great. And yeah, thanks for helping me discover this Waffle House. Really? Thank you. Because I'm always sending the other waffles, I'm always sending back my bacon because they cook it ahead of time. See, Waffle Houses, it, to me, it just reminds me of the road. It reminds me yeah. of those, those late night bus yep. stops after the gig. You know, you drive out about an hour. Yep. And everybody's hungry, and you stop at the Waffle House. And they're, and they're open. And you're either, you run into, like, other touring bands if it's the summer. Yep. And you just run into other crews. and I got man. And you see, uh, you know, you, you run into friends. It's just really kind of fun. It just has a lot, a lot of good memories at the Waffle House. Right? Yep. That Mike Castle. Yeah. Southern Ground, Nashville, and we're here with a good friend, Brandon. He's gonna show us uh, around, give us a little tour. Yeah, come on, let's check out Studio 8. This is incredible. It's a, it's a really special space. The high ceilings, the two stories, the energy in this place, yeah. and the feel of the room as soon as you walk in. I understand why the Zach Brown band sounds the way it does. It's a perfect room to, to make records in. I, I gotta show you one of the coolest ISO rooms I've seen yet. Look at this, <laughs> look at this little guy right here. That's so cool. It's tight in the corner here, but it's pretty well appointed for, uh, for the space. Wow! <laughs> you have a little bit of everything. You try to mix it up. 67s. All the old RCAs. classics. How beautiful is this console? <laughs> How beautiful is that? It's beautiful. <laughs> it's very no. beautiful. It's, alligator uh, skin? Yeah, alligator. Um, lacquered sides? Lacquered, well, airbrushed, custom airbrushed sides. <sighs> when, when Zach bought the building, there was a neat V3 in here. Zach was gracious enough to let us pick out you know, an 
a new console and, and the API fit the bill better than anything else we could find. It's uh, it's just easy for people oh. to be in communication. <laughs> Look how tall that is. That's so. <laughs> that's <is> so cool. <laughs> that, you know what? <laughs> See, I would be up there. Uh, can I get a little more 4K? Man, it's a great view of the room from up there. I'm it gonna, really I'm is. I'm gonna have to sit up there and take a take a peek at that. <laughs> um, that this console is just it's so tricked out. The only thing it needs is spinners. I love these reverbs. Man, it's really hard to beat them. And, yeah. and it's amazing having. I think at least two of these came from the same place and, and I think lived most of their life together before coming here. And So uh, you didn't separate them? We didn't separate them. I mean, what, what's unique about Southern Ground beyond the appearance is that uh, when we have a session in, we have uh, Rebecca Woods, our studio mama, and she'll come down and cook lunch for, for everybody in the band. I mean, I know having been a freelance engineer before and working at other studios, the meal is always the most difficult part. Is she around? What kind of All right, I have no idea where we are. I know we're somewhere in Tennessee still. Come on. <laughs> okay, this is the... Uh, the SSL you were talking about. Yeah, so it's a uh, SSL 4000. I think it's uh, 56 channels now. It, it had an extra bucket. It was a 64 channel desk originally. Um, but we, we chopped a bucket off to make it fit. <laughs> um, ATC 300s. Uh, well, you know, good assortment of outboard gear for a mix room. Um, and like I said earlier, we can patch the plates over from the shop. So if, if somebody wanted to mix with a plate, which who wouldn't? Uh, we, we patch a plate over here, but uh, I've been in here making a mess for a couple days. <laughs> so this is our budget, our budget tracking space. <laughs> well, I mean, how do these atomic sound? I love them. Really? I love them, and I, and I think they're also a really great deal for for the price. Coming out here exhausted, everybody's gone home, and just kind of, just hearing the room dead quiet. It's, I don't know, there's something special about it. And it's, it's that way with a lot of studios. You know, just the feeling of, I don't know, just the, the calm after the storm almost. It's just an amazing, amazing feeling, an amazing sound even. The thing I love about Nashville, it's, it's a community. It's a community of studios. It's a community of engineers, producers. It's a community of artists that come together and just make musical magic. This is a really beautiful room. Thank you. Now, you walk in here, the floor, the paneling. Tell, tell me a little bit about this room. Okay. It was just totally unfinished. It was an attic. There was no drywall. It was just all uh, framing. So there was a, this was all dropped with a, uh, you know, we just had joists going across this and just, you couldn't even see what was up in the ceiling. So I said, well, why don't we, want to remove the joists and take advantage of the 18-foot ceiling here. This is going to be a tracking room, but I would come in here for an hour at a time and stand here and think, what am I going to do? You know, because it was just so crazy. I mean, look at all those, the angles and all, right, and I had to all figure the cables. Out, and I had to make them symmetrical somewhat in the room. And I wanted to, you know, this, this is a beam. We couldn't take out this beam, so, but I was able to open, keep that open because I didn't want to create a cavity in there, so I kept that open. And then this kind of uh, dictated, you know, a drum cove. But uh, the way this cove works, this is all absorption behind here, except for those diffusion panels. 
and it almost acts as a uh, as a booth, so it doesn't like kill you out in the room. And if you want it to have more live, then you bring it out into the room. But what I was shooting for was uh, neutral. Um, yeah. I mean, that's what I always shoot for. Basically, this these two walls are all absorptive, and everything else is live except for the, the hanging panels. And so it's just you know, it's just right. Yeah. yeah. It has a it has a a live room feel. Right. Um, you but hear, controllable. Yeah. yeah, control. You hear a little bit of the tail, but yeah. not right. But not. It's very musical. Right. It's not too much, and it doesn't like it goes. It's a it's a sharp drop. Right. Right. I had to figure out how we could get some kind of a, a booth in here. So this acts as a booth, uh, combination booth, entrance vestibule, and machine room. Uh, I like to <clears throat> when I do my um, my booths. I like it very dead. Except you've got a big, the biggest window I can possibly find, so that if you want a little liveness, you, you play over here. Yeah. If you want a data over here, you know, gives you that flexibility. You know, it's cool is <clears throat> with the. With oh yeah, you can hear. The, you, you can hear that reverb. Yeah, it's probably, probably like a. Yeah, a nice little three second nice little trail there. Let me. Can I? You mind if I shut the door? Yeah. Nice one. We'll hear the before. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> wow. Do that again. That's dead. Yeah. This is a great control room. This is really, I mean, it feels really homey. I love the, the open window and the board just looks amazing. It just, what a great little board. I like the color. <laughs> when, when he picked the green, I said, let's go with the green, then we can get maple and it's, it'll really pop. It's so, I mean, this has a mm -hmm. look unlike any other studio that I've been to, especially with that, the tree audio, right? Is that what it is? Tree audio, yeah. And uh, they're just, uh, I think it's based on, uh, the concept is based off the um, Bill Putnam, uh, you know, the old studios, because there's no faders, you get knobs. And, you know, your first thought is like, how are you going to mix something without faders? But everybody mixes in the box now anyway, for the most part. Yeah, I mean, basically what you yeah. do is you set your levels and... <clears throat> yeah. And I can only imagine how... Pro this with that with room. This and that room and the saturation you'll get from the tubes. Wow. This is, this could have a really great, dense rock and roll oh, yeah. sound, yeah. you know? The fact that that you have a home studio that's this well thought out and this well designed and you did a lot had doing as much as you did in here with the limited amount of space it's pretty incredible a friend of mine came to me and said hey i have this girl that needs some material would you be willing to write some songs so there's a basement in the of the dorm that i was staying at and i wrote a few songs for this girl and eric blair was his name he came to me and says hey i these are good songs. I'd probably get Michael Sweet from Striper to play on it. And I went, what? So then he went to Michael Sweet, played these songs, and Michael Sweet came down uh, to the studio and recorded these songs. And shortly thereafter, Eric Blair came and we said, hey, Striper's looking for a keyboard player. As they were getting a little more pop, you know, pop rock, I said, I'd love to do it. So they, he came to me and says, hey, learn these songs from the previous album. So I learned the songs, and they had, gave me a chance to audition and I believe me I was very very nervous but I went up there and rehearsed and kind of the rest is history shortly thereafter when I was working in a warehouse I get a call over the intercom saying Brent uh, there's a phone call from Janice Sweet which I knew was their mom and manager and when I got on the phone she wanted to interview me for, for the gig and that's where my whole career started here we are, Salt Lake City, at the, what Coliseum is this, Brent? Sports Arena. Sports Arena. So, okay, it's a big gig. It looks all nice and good, right? But I'm about to show you the expose of this tour. Follow me. The problem is, is we didn't have a drum riser, so we had to make one ourselves. So we got tables. These tables are almost dude. Here it is, look. We don't know if this is going to hold. We'll find out. We'll find out. We probably got a, uh, uh, playing a good venue today. Large stage, room, step, and everything. This is going to be a little trimmed out from last tour, but I try to keep it simple this time around because I wouldn't try all the stuff. Well, we're going home in a few days, so. What do you think about Bob's drum riser situation? 
Well, it'll be fun. I can't wait to see what's gonna happen. <laughs> if it falls, hey, it'll be cool to see it. <laughs> Dixon Studios, owned by Jonathan Cain from Journey. And you may be asking yourself, why do you name it Addiction? Well, before the studio was here, there was a little house here that was a rehab. <gasps> this is a great little, oh my gosh. What a great little isolation room. You gotta see this. Come over here. I wanna make room. How cool is that? Wow. So back a couple of records ago, um, John found this piano in San Francisco and he heard about Fazioli. He's an Italian piano maker. And I think John paid around 120 grand for it. Went to the recording studio, absolutely fell in love with it. And then, after the record was done, he asked me if we could take it on the road. Would it be safe? And so I built the, this fancy schmancy road case for it. And uh, as you could tell, I worked hard to keep it in really good shape. And I felt, you know, nervous, you know, setting up every day. Hopefully I had good stage hands. This is the tracking room, obviously, and he's had orchestras in here, a lot of famous bands. So everything's kind of set up and mic ready to go. If you just want to walk in and start recording, you can. I love the natural light that comes in here. Yep. And his ex-wife Liz did the, it's all these chandeliers, put her touch on it. I like the corner, there's ISO rooms in the corners too, right? Yeah. That's really, really cool. This is big. This is a big... Yeah, you can put a small orchestra in you here. You can, I can tell. This is really cool. This is really cool. Here's some history here. So, this is an old Roland Jupiter 8 that we pulled out of his storage unit when, we, when he moved from California to Nashville. Right. I pulled it out, had a dead battery, ordered a new battery had an old tape cassette recorder that you loaded the sounds in. And sure shoot, and I put it in there, loaded the sounds. And this is the actual Jupiter 8 that John played separate ways on. Wait, wait, that's the actual keyboard this from, from the music video? Yes, this is the actual keyboard from, <laughs> from, from 1983. And as you can tell, there's a piece of tape on here that says separate ways, VRS, separate ways, and then a faithfully ending. So it's all presets, <laughs> but it's a really clean shape. I mean, um, and this one, this goes back to when John was with the babies, the band before he was with Journey. And it's an old, old Wurlitzer. And this is the song he actually wrote Open Arms on. That one? This is the exact one. Wow. Anyway, this is when he, and what's interesting, so he was with the babies when he wrote Open Arms. Okay. So he went to John Waite and goes, hey, I got this ballad. And Waite heard it, and he goes, no, that's not rock and roll. So John didn't, pit, um, didn't use it with the babies, but then when he got with Journey, um, he went to Perry and goes, hey, I got this little ballad. And Perry goes, I could probably do something with that. Nice. This is the big control room. This is really, really nice. And this is... Uh, Jonathan's is his Trident TSN board. And uh, he bought this from the record plant. When we, I drove this with Jonathan in a U-Haul truck from California out here. Are you serious? Yeah. This desk came from um, 
Rex Plant's Sausalito. Uh, Stevie Wonder, Songs of the Key of Life was recorded on this console. Songs of the Key of Life was recorded on yeah, this console. on this console, along with... Uh, that is... Yeah. That's crazy. Hugh Loose and the New Sports. Um, a bunch of Aerosmith stuff, a bunch of Journey stuff, obviously. Uh, what are, okay, you had yeah. me at Stevie Wonder Songs of the Key Yeah, there you go, man. Hey man, thanks for the tour. This is man, really cool. Yeah, my pleasure. I like, man. and there's like music history all I know. around. Yep, all around. Like walk down memory lane, and this is stuff that Jonathan used back in the day. So I was out on the American Idol tour, and about almost towards the end, I get a phone call from the Journey people, and they notified me saying, "Hey, listen, we have this one-off gig that's after the tour." And the keyboard tech said pretty much, no, I'm, I'm done. Go F yourself. I don't know if I could use that or not. So they called me and they said, hey, we see that you have a day off uh, between Denver and San Francisco on the American Idol tour. Can we fly you out for this one off in San Francisco? And I said, sure. But I didn't have my piano tuning stuff. So they flew me out. I had my roommate fly my piano tuning stuff out. And when my tuner arrived, it showed up broken. So now I have to tune the piano by ear, which I have not done since I went to the piano tuning school. So there I am, tuning the piano by ear, and what happens? Neil Sean decides to come out on stage while, when it was quiet, and start, start noodling at full volume. And I'm trying to tune and going, oh, this is not a good way to start. So I remember putting my head down, going, oh, this, I don't know, this is not gonna work. And the lighting director came up to me and goes, is everything all right? I go, dude, this is my first day. I'm trying to tune. Neil Sean's out there noodling. I can't hear what I'm doing. And all of a sudden, he looks up at Neil and goes, hey, Neil, cut it down. The piano tuner's trying to tune. I went, no, 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 no. And Neil looks, looks, at, looks at him and looks at me and goes, and he walked off. I went, oh, no, I just pissed off Neil Sean my first day. <laughs> Anyway, so I was nervous. I tuned the piano the best of my ability by ear. All of a sudden, Jonathan Kane walks out. And now I'm just like nervous, totally nervous. He shakes my hand. He goes over and starts playing. And he hits a few notes, you know, starts. And then he turns around, looks at me and goes, good work, doctor. I just like, <sighs> and then, you know. And then, anyway, the rest is history. And that kind of sealed the deal with me getting the gig with Journey. Biggest pain in the butt on the road is laundry. And yet you love laundry. I don't mind laundry. I've never <laughs> minded it. I like doing my own laundry on the road. I'm like, we did a show where the laundry guy, he was the runner, went out and did the laundry. Then he was supposed to go out and pick it up to bring it back. And he, for some reason, got really upset. He just quit. He drove off, never came back. <laughs> never came back. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, well, he didn't go pick up the laundry. He just said, I'll go pick up the laundry. He never came back. Come to find out he quit. And so the people who sent out the laundry didn't get their, they had to like FedEx it to the next gig. Well, Blackbird is a recording studio in Nashville, Tennessee, and I'm a competitive SOB, so Nashville, I feel like, gets treated like a redhead stepchild by LA and New York. And I thought, you know, I need to build a studio that'll kick the shit out of anything in LA or New York. <laughs> and we did. This is our version, or Blackbird's version, of a reverb chamber. Hey! Hey! Oh, oh my, the extra element of this is. Woo! No way! The ceiling goes up. Yeah, you pay extra for that sound. <laughs> I'm very proud of this place. I love music, I love gear, I love audio, I love microphones. And they're all just basically tools that people need to get the job done. I look at the producer and engineer and artist as painters, and you want to give them every color on the palette. You know, you don't want to go, sorry, we don't have brown today, whatever, you know? Yeah. You want to give them anything they need to, right. to make their 
record. There was a rumor flying around for a long time that if you went on eBay and you were bidding on vintage microphones, that odds are you were bidding against you. Oh. <laughs> Did you get a lot of your... I don't know Did how you... true... You know, it's funny. <laughs> I, I bought a few things on eBay, but really... I mostly deal with individuals okay. or dealers. So tell us, Rolf, tell us, tell us a couple of your, uh, about a couple of the microphones here. Oh gosh, with just a couple? At any given time, we've got about 12 to 1400 microphones in the collection. Just a little bit of everything. What is that? Vintage, that's a, one of the earliest ribbon mics, and we have about a dozen of those. It's a Telefunken 201. Oh made. my, I've never seen that microphone. Got a few more. Oh my God. Got about a dozen of all the classic ribbon wow. mics and these mics. So we got some of those. Oh my goodness. 77s. Wow. And then these are the old skunk mics, the KU2s. Oh my goodness. Those are old soundstage mics. And the operators, they were on the ends of these long booms on the sound stages, And they were maybe 20, 25 feet away on the end of the boom. And in order for the operator to see where the ribbon was, yeah. they painted a white stripe on them. Wow. So. That's why they got nicknamed the skunk mics. There's more of the, those are the KU3s. Right there. Wow. Let's see. And those were the flagship RCA mics for a long time. And we've got about a dozen of those. And then at any given time, a bunch of those guys, the 44s are in there. So when are we recording in here, Mike? <laughs> I Our know. Next adventure. Uh, <laughs> yeah, look at that. We even have some of those. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. We're in Studio A right now, yes. correct? And this has the the new console. Neve 870. Um, yeah. And then Studio B has the um, an API. API the Legacy, Legacy. Plus. Yeah. And then you got Studio C. That's SSL. And then D. API. And then uh, E. API. E. Wow. F. Well. In the, in the box. G is pretty much in the box. H has a, an API. Wow. And I is also in the box. Wow. So. Well, one thing that separates us from a lot of studios, we have a pretty immense amount of band gear. You know, we've got 60-something drum kits, 160 snares, we've got bass rigs and probably 70 guitar amps and a lot of stuff. See? And about 100 guitars oh, wow. that lay around here. And if someone can use those to better their record, well, shit, I'm not gonna, you know, That's... I'm gonna go, let me go grab this I started the school five years ago. Right. The reason I started that school, though, I should say this, is because we we have nine rooms. We have a lot of interns. Right. Let's say we have 16 interns. These were all graduates from various programs. Some one year, two year, four year, whatever. Different, you know, some were colleges, some were trade schools, whatever. I love it. And... The problem was we'd get these interns in and they couldn't make a record if I held a gun to their head. Oh, man. They didn't know half, they didn't know 10% of what they needed to know. And that really frustrated me. I thought, this is wrong, you know, and it is. Um, and then you find out how much debt they had. And you right. Go, oh, shit. That's not inexpensive. It's insult to injury, you know. So I decided at that moment, I'm going to start a school. Our five-year anniversary was this month. Last year, we turned a profit for the first time. Wow. Like 14 grand, I go, yeah. <laughs> but I don't care because our kids are working all over the world. Oh, that's fantastic. A lot of great careers are getting started thanks to this school, and that really does my heart good. And that's it's awesome. one of the most rewarding things that I get to experience. Wow. It really is. That's fantastic. Yeah. Man.
I wish the school would have been around when I started. Yeah. It would have saved me 10 years. <laughs> I'm a lucky man because I get to work in music. My wife's a singer. I'm an engineer, so our, co our careers complement each other. That's been a great thing for us. Because, you know, if I was an accountant or something, I'd have blown my brains out probably, but um, <laughs> no. she'd be touring and I'd be sitting at home going, what the hell? You yeah. know, that doesn't work. Yeah. I don't know. I heard it doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah. But no, I'm a very fortunate guy that I get to work in music. You know, being a keyboard tech for now going on 32 years has just been an absolute blessing. Although in the early stages, I really wanted to be that rock star out on stage, and I never got quite there. You know, I got to be where I was offstage keyboard player, but I think God's calling for me was to actually get into the technology and be a keyboard tech working for artists. And it's been, like I said, a, a total joy. I have no regrets and being able to travel the world and to all the many places I've been, work with my absolute favorite bands. And I honestly say there's never been a band that I did not like working for. Everyone's always been wonderful to work for. It's always been a step up. Every band I've toured, it's always gone to the next level. And getting the, the opportunity to work with people like Journey, and Striper, and, you know, David Foster, the Sticks, you know, I've, I feel really blessed. You know what? This is home. This is where I can still do what I do. This is a place where I can still do my music. Work, you know, in the studio, work with bands. But it's it's not LA. It's not, you know, it's, it's a whole different culture. And it's what I fell in love with. You know, I met my wife across the street, you know, we got married shortly after, you know, it's just you know, those places where you come to and you just fall in love with it, you make it your home. Outside and get some shots. It's really pretty today. So, hey, goodbye, Brent. Goodbye, Brent.